red zone. <laughs> well, good morning. Good morning. The wife of Blaine you want to go. What we thank you. What we have in mind. But good Lord, then on it, and something happens. Uh, does anybody have an extra room? <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, it's all in good hands. <clears throat> Reading today is in Psalms 56, 11 through 13. <clears throat> in God I trust and am not afraid. What can man do to me? I am under vow to you, my God. I will present my thank offerings to you. For you have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. So be it. bow with me in prayer father in heaven we do thank you and praise you lord that we can come and freely worship you we thank you that we can pick up any type of bible on about any type of app or in written form or whatever lord and we can search your word so there's no excuse that we're not reading and searching daily no excuse that we're not praying lord help us to be a people that are prayerfully dependent that are reading your scriptures that are seeking you lord because you will be found by us Help us to realize that our lives are not our own. They're purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ and that we are your ambassadors in this foreign world, Lord. That we can enjoy the things that's in this earth, but not to lose focus and let them become idols, but to be the examples that you have called us to be, to give and to help where we've called to, Lord. And just help us to walk in step with the Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So sometimes you wonder if some of the songs are kind of picked out. Well, this time they are. So if you think about those songs, because um, Sherry and I discussed them when we went camping, they're kind of what you might think that Paul had as things that he thought about in his life all the time. Or maybe David did, because you read a lot of psalms that David wrote this week, and you read a lot of uh, information about Paul and his third missionary journey and then on into Jerusalem. That is if you read, okay? You've got to read it. So I'm going to say it again. You should have read Psalms 51 through 69, and you should have read Acts 20, verses 17 through 24. That doesn't take that much long to, time to do. A lot of information there. We're in the second of five books of Psalms, if you didn't know that. There's five different books. Chapters, or Psalms 42 to 72 are the second uh, section or the second book. Most of these songs are written about David, and if you didn't notice, most of these songs are written, written with lament in mind or distress in mind. He's searching for God, asking Him if He'll take care of these things in His life, whatever they are, and I know that's uncommon to you. You don't have any problems in life. You know, when I read them, I'm like, yeah, yeah, and then I think, well, how do you answer those prayers? And then we're reading about Paul, and I'll go to the spoiler alert at the end. He just gets forgot about in prison for two years. Wow. How do you know God's timing? How do you know you're walking in step with the Spirit? How do you know that? There's no special plan. I've got plenty of books before how to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, do these five things, and blah, 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 blah. Again, blah, 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 blah. When you are saved, you are baptized with the Holy Spirit through and through, given the power and ability that the Holy Spirit chooses to give you to be a missionary and ambassador in this world to give your witness about Jesus Christ. But that does mean we need to look at life a little differently than we did before, doesn't it? That my plans that I make are not necessarily the plans and the steps I'm going to make, and who knows what's going to happen. But even in prison, an earthquake can come and we can be set free, and, and a jailer can be saved and his family too, or that might not be the case. I might be forgotten about for two years. I think about uh, Joseph and his, his integrity and everything during prison and, and, and so forth. You, you have every right to cry out to God. He wants you to cry out to God, but you don't know how He's going to answer your prayers. You do know that He listens, that He hears, and that He will answer your prayers in His timing and His way. 
And it doesn't matter how he does because his ways are perfect and just. And the fact that he gave his son's life to save me, it's worth any light and momentary thing that we face on this world. Now, that may help you some. It may not help you. Because usually when you're going through those things, it's hard to think about that. But you can always turn to the Psalms and read and everything or whatever part of Scripture. I know growing up in high school, everything was stressful, right? So I was constantly reading Psalms. And I would read that part about my enemies, you know. But I kind of read it with the wrong heart. You, you, love even your enemies. Turn your other cheek. Lend to those without expecting payment in return. But the, the, the mindset of Jesus Christ going to the cross for me and you is amazing, amazing grace and love. The key in the laments and the stress is trusting in God. He is your strength. He is your deliverer. The time will come even if it comes at death and He will deliver you an eternal life into His presence. So don't ever lose sight of that. We started out with the psalm that's a, a true lament of your sin where David realized that he committed sin with Bathsheba and I enjoy going camping because I stopped from work and the other things to talk about these things and that's a psalm I, I don't, it was not a psalm it's a sin that I don't understand of David's how he could do that but Sherry gave me a lot of insight he was a king he did what he wanted to and not because, because he had that attitude but he did he had so many wives and concubines and he did what he wanted to because he was the king but he was a pretty good king. He was a just king and so forth. And he was a man after God's own heart. You remember that? God rejected Saul because he didn't have God's purpose and intent in mind. And it made me stop and think, you know, how imperfect I am. How sinful and wretched that I am. Even that I am a child of God, I continue to sin. And there are plenty of sins I don't realize that I'm doing till I am smacked with them in the face. So why in the world would I judge David? You kind of want to think when you point fingers at other people, which you don't want to judge in the first place, how could they do that? But instead of doing that, why don't you say like D David said, examine my heart, O oh God. Take anything from me. It's against you and only you that I have sinned, and I am sorry that I have done that. Would you think that Saul, which is Paul, I know Saul, you're talking about Saul in the Old Testament, but I'm talking about Saul that met Jesus face to face and was forever changed. He was zealous for the word of God before and everything, but misdirected. Do you think he was a man after God's heart? I mean, you have two fine examples, one in the Psalms and one in, the, in his life and how he lived. And we're going to go over some of those things. Back to Saul in the Old Testament, that's why I'm trying not to confuse you. If you read Scripture, you can again look over and not realize the heart factor behind it. The Philistines were preparing for battle and King, Song's there, King Saul is there and all the Israelites are in fear of the Philistines and everything and Samuel's taking his time to get there. But Samuel's the one that's supposed to offer the sacrifice before they go into battle. It just seems logical to me as a man trying to guide my own steps that Samuel's not here yet. Maybe I'll do the sacrifices. That seems logical to me again. But where is my heart dependent upon God in whatever circumstance that I'm in? And boy, that brings me back to whatever circumstances I'm in and ask me, how am I trusting God through all this? How would I react when I was beaten and put into jail? Would I be singing hymns and songs at midnight? that the, the prisoners would hear and the jailer and his family would hear to such a place where when they had an opportunity to escape, not only they were there, but all of the prisoners. So the jailer would say, what must I do to be saved? Is that the kind of life that I'm living? That someone would say, what must I do to be saved? So Saul offered the sacrifices, but Samuel said in 1 Samuel 13, verse 11, what have you done? Asked Samuel. Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattered and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembled at Michmash, I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the Lord's favor. 
So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of the people, because you have not kept the Lord's commandments. Saul did what he thought was right, but his heart was far from it. And then that shows his pride his interest, why he's doing those things. Oh, maybe that makes a little sense now why Jesus said to those that cried out and said, Lord, Lord, we've done mighty miracles in your name. But they didn't know him because their hearts were far from him. Why do you do the things that you do? Do you do them out of obligation or do you do them out of sincere love because you're overwhelmed with a God who loved you enough to give his son for you? Do you, do, do you shout out and praise God praise, to the King of kings and Lord of lords because of Jesus loved you so much or just because it's tradition or it's what I choose to do? Are you madly in love with your first love? We went over those things last week, the church in Ephesus. <clears throat> compared to Saul, compared to David, when David sinned, which seems so much more heinous, he truly repented. And I know for a fact that I sin, and I know you do too. <laughs> so what is your heart like when you get caught up face to face with your Lord and He says, you've done wrong? Do you make excuses or do you repent and fall on your knees and thank God for the grace that He's given you? Psalm 51 have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great comp compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and only you have I sinned and have done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in the verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me, yet you desire faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Do you see a difference in two men's sin and how they turned to God and asked for, for forgiveness and repented? Now, let's fast forward to Paul, Saul called Paul. And how would you describe him? Would you describe him? Scripture doesn't, but would you describe him as a man that sought after God's own heart? Because when you read these chapters that we read this week, you might be kind of confused. If you read commentaries and stuff, you might be confused more. Did Paul sin by going to Jerusalem? Because he was warned not to. Did you catch that? That's why I'm asking you if you re read this especially, because by the prophe prophecy given by the Spirit, people prophesied to Paul, don't go. And yet he went anyway. Was it his own steps? Was it his stubbornness? Was it misunderstood prophecy? What was it? And I'm not going to give you the, the, the fail-safe answer here. I'm just saying that when we go out in life and you decide what you're doing next, whatever that may be, you don't have any idea what's going to go along. You can make your plans all day long, but God guides you and directs you. He is sovereign over all things. Anything that happens in your life, He knew that it would happen and allowed it, and He will bring glory, honor, and praise to Him, and hopefully you because of how you act and respond during that. And if you do it, somebody might say, what must I do to be saved? I mean, that's the life we live as Christians. The Holy Spirit empowers us all the time. Paul had that. David didn't have that. David only longed for that. You have that. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you, guides you, and directs you so that you can walk in step with the Spirit, but it's hard to understand. Yes, God's words are here. Yes, you pray and everything, but you don't have a burning bush to go consult, do you? So you have to take those steps and see what happens. And maybe you step out of the boat, and maybe you walk on water for a little bit, and then you sink. But at least you stepped out of the boat where the other guys in the boat didn't. So you take those steps reading God's Word, knowing what's in, 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 in His heart for you to do, 
but not knowing exactly what that is. But you know you're supposed to be a witness. You know you're supposed to live a life accordingly. You know you're supposed to think of others of yourself. And if you're doing that, trouble may come, trouble may not come. You may know the exact direction of the Holy Spirit. You may not. But I guarantee you, you'll be walking along the way that Jesus walked. And that's what Paul was persecuted for, was the way that he lived his life. How do you know for sure if it's the Spirit's voice, though, and not your own? How do you even know from others that are giving you advice if it's the Spirit's voice or not? Well, spend a lot of time in prayer and consulting and everything else and make sure that you're, the people that you're listening to are, give spiritual advice and so forth. There's plenty of advice that I can give you, but the main thing is walking with Jesus. Everything I do, everything I breathe, everything I, I want in my life is to proclaim glory to God because of what Jesus Christ has done for me, and you're going on the right path. So are you spending more and more and more and more and more time seeking God's will, spending time with Jesus? Are you in love with Him as much as you were the first day, or even more because you understand more about Him now and the things that He's done for you? And just that day you were overwhelmed by it, but now you understand it even more and more as you read God's Word, and you're becoming more and more mature in Christ and more like Christ. Are you spending more and more and more time, or are you spending more and more time on yourself? Your ways. I know that's tough to, 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 do, to think about because we get caught up in this world. But we were bought with a price, the blood of Jesus Christ, to be His hands and feet. And when the Holy Spirit came upon us, we were given power to carry out the mission that we have already given the authority to do it. So are you living like Christ in this world so that people will say, what must I do to be saved? Okay, we left off in Acts with a long sermon, right? So I'll try to keep that in mind today that literally killed uh, Eutychus. But it didn't, because he was raised back to life. That's where we left off at. Uh, Paul is leaving and continuing his third missionary journey, and he has a fourth missionary journey planned out in his head. He knows exactly what he's going to do. He's going to go to, to Spain, and he's going to stop along the way to Rome, maybe stop on the way back to Rome, because it's in that path. Long way to travel. Think about it by uh, animal or by foot, and we're talking a long way, the whole continent of, of Europe. But he wanted to do it because he wanted to spread the gospel message because it's all he dreamed about. He thought of others more than themselves and wanted them to know salvation. But he longed for the people in Jerusalem too, his own people. He says he would be accursed in Scripture if his own people would accept Jesus Christ. So he longs to go back to Jerusalem before he starts, and he's got a reason to go back. He's taking the offering back to the people in Jerusalem as well. And he resolutely sets out to Jerusalem. I said that, said that to make a point, just like Jesus resolutely sent, out, sent himself out. He wanted to be there for the day of the Pentecost, the 50th day, the day after the... After the uh, celebration of the weeks. The day that the Holy Spirit came upon when crowds would be gathered from everywhere. He wanted to be there just like then to proclaim the message of Jesus Christ. But is, it, but is this what the Holy Spirit was leading him to do or not? It's not a cut and try answer here. So don't look for it. Okay? Was this God's plan or Saul's plan? How can you know? You will not know in everything that you face in your life, but you can walk in the steps of the Spirit by continuing to do the things, by reading God's Word, by trusting in Him, by seeking. But it doesn't mean that after you get up and reading your Bible for a few hours and praying for a few hours, you're going to have the answer to everything. We walk by faith, not by sight. Back to Acts chapter 20, verse 16. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia, for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible by the day of Pentecost. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you from the first day I came into the province of Asia. I served the Lord with great humility and with tears in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem. Now, maybe you can make your decision based off that. 
Paul has spent three and a half years at Ephesus training up a church, training a church to love Jesus with all of their heart, mind, soul, body, and strength, and to go out and live a life so the world would know it. He's put elders in place, and he's coming back, and he's giving them this attaboy speech to continue on because he knows he's not going to see them again. And he says here specifically, And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, Verse 23, I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. Well, we see that from Paul's journey so far. And we see his obedience, we see his love, and we see conversions, and we see people that don't accept Jesus either. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of, Je of God's grace. I don't know about you, but those could be three verses, verses 22 to 24, that I should pattern my life after every single day. I don't know how Paul knew, how much he knew he was compelled by the Spirit or not. I know that the Spirit told him not to go, and he went and found Lydia, who went back to the church in Thyatira. But I don't know what the Spirit told him at this point, except what Luke writes. Compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem. And that's what Paul did. Okay, but now he gets some other advice along the way, so let's read some more. Now I know that none of, none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole, whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. By shepherds, by, be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. The spiritual battle rages and rages and rages, and it will rage until King Jesus returns. So be on your guard, verse 31. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of, each of you night and day with tears. Paul was passionate about what he did and what he taught so that we could live like him, imitating him who imitates Christ in this world. Verse 32, Now I commit, to, commit you to God and to the word of His grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work we must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus Himself, it is more blessed to give than receive. Paul has done everything he can to preach the gospel message and to live it. Christianity in action. The church being the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Helping others not worrying about the things we have, but considering them gifts from God to be generous with. Verse 36, When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was, the, was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. Nothing wrong with that. They grieved Paul, but they wanted him to come back. But he was saying, you're on your own. It's your time to go out. So he's leaving them to go to Jerusalem. And he says, specifically here, he's compelled by the Spirit of God to do this. Okay? So let's keep on reading. Acts chapter 21, Paul sets out on his mission to Jerusalem, and he goes with haste and earnesty because he wants to make it in time. So Acts 21 starts out, We landed at Tyre, where our ships was to unload cargo. This is verse 3. We sought out the disciples there and stayed with them for seven days. Through the Spirit they urged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. What? Say it again. What? <laughs> We've just read that the Holy Spirit has compelled God to go to Jerusalem. And now we have these people that have been given a gift of prophecy telling Paul not to go. Now I'm going to give you a simple explanation, but it doesn't mean it's the right explanation. I get a prophecy from God that... I'm going to use this one because Sherry's not in here. On the way back from Georgia, <laughs> you're going to come into trouble and be stranded. And that doesn't say don't go. That's just warning me there's going to be struggle. In fact, Paul said after that, the Holy Spirit reminded him that in every town he went, there was going to be hardships and trouble. But you would say, naturally, because you love me so much, 
hey, don't go. Go, go a different time because if you go this time, you're going to be stranded. Maybe that explains it. We don't know for sure. But Paul said he was compelled by the Spirit to go and you see his heart, you see his attitude, you see his love for one another. Wow! He wanted to proclaim the message of Jesus Christ because he was as madly in love with Jesus as the day he first met Jesus on the road. Verse 7, We continued our voyage from Tyre and landed at Potlamus, where we greeted the brothers and sisters and stayed with them for a day. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. This is Philip who we read about who carried the gospel message to Samaria and then to the Ethiopian eunuch and everything. And now he's in his home. We didn't know what happened to him before until we read this. He's in his home. He's had a family. He has four daughters following the Lord. Yes! You're in whatever ministry you're in where you're at because God has placed you there. And unless you feel compelled by the Spirit to go somewhere else, be compelled by the Spirit to be an example where you are. If you're not proclaiming Jesus Christ in English, don't ever expect the Holy Spirit to give you the tongues of Spanish or any other language. Verse 10, After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, The Holy Spirit says, In this way the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. Well, isn't that exactly what happens? The Holy Spirit gave him the, the true prophecy because it came true. When we heard this, wait a minute, we, when we heard this, that means Luke, doesn't it? When we heard this, this means whoever was with him at this time. When we heard this, and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Because I don't want you to be put into bonds, into stocks again. Didn't that happen in every place I've been already? Didn't I get beaten for it? Do you think that's going to scare me from, from preaching the gospel message? And I have an earnesty so much that I, that I write, write it in God's Word that I would be accursed if only they could be saved. So he's going. <laughs> Paul answered, verse 13, we, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When, when he would not be dissuaded, he gave up and said, when he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. Now, I got to wonder, and I entitled this sermon this, which is whether it's a proper title or not, I put, entitled it when others stand in your way. Because I kind of feel like even though they had good intentions, they were standing in his way. But you don't know that. So that takes a time to spend more time in prayer seeking God's Word. But if you are in love with Jesus and wanting to minister and you step out of that boat, I think you made the right decision by stepping out. Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? And then they said, the Lord's will be done. How do you think they said that? If I got it said that you are an idiot for not listening to me, I'd said idiot, then I'm going to say, well, the Lord's will be done. But maybe they meant it, the Lord's will be done, because they all said, we don't know everything. We're going to stand behind you because you, you're going on this ministry. We're going to support you. I don't know which way it's meant. I want to say the second, because I want to think that they had Christ in their heart like that, especially Luke. And they said, well, we can't stop you, so we, we, we don't know. Maybe they examined them, what the Holy Spirit said to them and came to that conclusion. But Paul knows he's going regardless. Okay? Whether he did wrong or didn't do wrong, there's nothing in Scripture to point to you that he did wrong. But like I said, if you read commentaries, there's a lot of divided about Paul shouldn't have because he didn't properly listen to the Holy Spirit. He listened to himself. There's nothing to point that out. And I'm not going to be a judge of anybody, anybody or anything. You do what you feel God is leading you to do. And if you suffer, Jesus said, don't be surprised. <laughs> okay? Paul arrives, arrives in Jerusalem where there's a, conf I'm going to call this a confusing spirit from the church. Verse 17, when we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James and the elders were present. Paul greeted them, reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard this, they praised God. Okay? Paul talked about his ministry and everything. That's amazing. All these churches, all these Gentiles coming to Christ. Let's praise God. But keep reading. 
Then they said to Paul, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed? They turn it back to their ministry. I'm, this is a perfect time to talk about Christine and Eric. Eric. It's the church's ministry, but Christine and Eric feel compelled to do it. So if they go to a church that has the ability, the people to do it, it might be the best thing in the world. And then we might come along later and help support by doing a camp out in the church or whatever to show people that we're unified in this ministry of going out and bringing boys and girls to Jesus Christ and training them up properly. We don't know what the Holy Spirit has in store. But they wanted to turn it into, this is my ministry, this is your ministry. That's sad. At least that's what it appears like in Scripture. You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law. Not zealous for Jesus. Zealous for the law. They're still holding on to works of righteousness, which you know that we can't do. They're still holding on to Jesus plus. If you'd only hold on to Jesus alone, wow, maybe you could be so filled with the Holy Spirit that you wouldn't consider your life or your possessions your own. Maybe you would be truly set free, free indeed because you've been set free in Jesus Christ. They have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or living according to our customs. What shall we do then? Paul just told them, he brought a gift, he's told them the amazing things that has been proclaimed about the gospel all over the world. And they said, well, let's praise God. But then they just kind of changed their tune. And they asked Paul to go through a ritual to protect him from the people there. If Paul's guilty of anything, and I said if again, it might be for letting them stand in his way and going ahead and doing it. I don't know. I know Paul was compelled up to this point, and I know at this point Paul did something that surprised me in Scripture. Not that he did anything wrong. Verse 25, As for the Gentile believers, we have written to them, that our, uh, them our decision that they should abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. Yeah, we know all that. We know that Paul and Barnabas already went and told them that. Why would you bring this up again? It's like... There's these Christians and these Christians. Oh, it does kind of sound like the church today, doesn't it? I can't worship with you. You're this denomination. You believe that. Oh, you don't do this this way. You don't do that this way. Aren't we all baptized by the Holy Spirit to profess Jesus Christ, if that is who we believe in, and Jesus and nothing else, because He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Him? There are no works of righteousness you can do or anything else. You're saved by grace and grace alone in your faith in Jesus Christ. So then what separates man? Except that man separates himself because of his prejudice and everything else because that's not a love that Christ had because Christ died for all. When the seven days were nearly over, verse 27, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him. Did you notice that? When the seven days were nearly over, Paul didn't get time to fulfill the ritual because the ritual is meaningless. It's about the Savior the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And it sure is meaningless if you do it with the wrong heart. That's why I started with Saul and his sacrifice. It seemed logical to me, but he knew the law that God set up. What if the church had stood up for Paul instead and said, wait a minute, this is the man who spread the gospel message all over the world, and we've already said there's no difference between Gentiles or Greeks and, and Jews. Why are we quarreling, brothers? What if they would have said that instead? Verse 31, while they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the rioters saw the commander and his soldier, they stopped beating Paul. So Paul's been beaten again. They had an intent to kill him. How bad do you think he's beaten? Don't miss this. Because, I mean, I'm sure he's beaten to a bloody pulp. But he had to go to Jerusalem because he loved his brothers and sisters, the ones that would beat him and yell to basically to him, crucify him, crucify him. But Paul's heart is so driven for what Jesus did for him that he cannot stop preaching God's Word. I'd say that's a man after God's own heart. Acts 22, Paul gives his testimony. The crowds 
listen until he mentions preaching salvation to the Gentiles again. And then they get in such an uproar that everything is out of control. The commander of the, of the garrison there takes Paul away with the intent of whipping him with the cat and nine tails and everything to tell the truth of what he's done wrong. And he says, the only thing I've done wrong is preach the resurrection through Jesus Christ. Are you willing to suffer? Are you willing to do whatever to preach Jesus Christ? Do you have that compassion so much that you would even go to your enemy and turn the other cheek and every time you have a chance, preach it? So go, Paul goes before the religious authorities. Acts chapter 23. And he says he's done nothing wrong but, but, but preach the resurrection. And that divides them because there are Sadducees and Pharisees again. We can't get along because we can't worship the same. We can't get along with each other because if I believe in resurrection, I don't. I believe in angels, I do. The dispute became so violent, verse 10 of Acts chapter 23, that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces. Not just killed, but literally torn in pieces. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by forcing and bringing him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Now I'm going to stop a minute. Oh, wait a minute. Those people that got the prophecy, and if they saw this happening to Paul, that he was literally being torn into, wouldn't they say again, Don't go, Paul! But what did he say? I'm going because I'm compelled by the Holy Spirit to preach God's Word. And now he's in such a predicament. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul. No, not, not doesn't say there's a vision or a dream. It says the Lord stood near Paul. Jesus himself, just like he appeared on the road to Damascus and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. I don't know whether Paul was following the direction of the Holy Spirit or not, but I know that Jesus was with him all the way, because Scripture says it here. So you might miss one little thing that the Holy Spirit is telling you along the way. I would be surprised if you caught it all. <laughs> but if you're walking in the way of Jesus, you're doing what you should be. How about how many times when you have felt the nudging of the Holy Spirit and pretty compelled that it was, but then you said, not now, maybe later, I got this to do first, but Lord, whatever it was. Is that walking in the Spirit? I mean, there's one thing when you know for sure clarity or you feel the nudging and there's other things to deny the Holy Spirit when He's talking to you. You've got to be spending time in God's Word. You've got to be praying. You've got to be spending time with one another. You can't have anything entangle you or sins hold you down. Verse 12, The next morning some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. I'm going to read that again. The next morning some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. Well, you know what happened. Paul went on. Right? Roman garrison and everything. I wonder if those guys starved to death. Did they fulfill their vow? Is that what's important? Or what's important is following Jesus Christ and loving Him and loving others. Enough that no greater love does a man know but to lay down your life for a friend. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests and elders and said, We have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Forty men. And Paul was escorted out of town by 470 Roman soldiers. Now that's God. But the story doesn't go the way we think it's going to go. Because Paul goes before Festus, I mean for Felix. He's on trial there and Felix wants to hear what he's got to say. Verse 22 of Acts chapter 23. Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. When Lysias, the commander, comes, he said, I will decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. Okay, this is pretty good. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. He sent for Paul and listened to him. He spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was terrified. I don't know what, verse, what version yours has, but it means to be distressed in your spirit. He came face to face with the Holy Spirit, and he denied him. So there's the first thing. 
Are you listening to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit has baptized you? Have you come to a salvation experience through Jesus Christ? And then are you living your life where you will walk in step with the Spirit because you're reading God's Word, you're doing everything else because you're so in love with Jesus as much as you were from day one that that's all that matters to you? Because that's exactly what Paul lived. Don't pick him apart for anything else. He's a man. He said, why do I do the things I do not choose to do? But praise God that I have the Holy Spirit living in me. Righteousness, that I have been made right with God, set apart, that my sins have been forgiven. Self-control, so that I can condemn the things of this world. They won't have power or anything else over me. And judgment to come, because I don't have the fear of the judgment anymore. I've been pardoned, but I fear a holy, righteous God who gives me life and who has the authority to throw me in hell or not. That's who Jesus told us to be afraid of. Felix was afraid, and he said, That's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I'll send for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe, the love of money being the root of all evil. We live for the things of this world, or we live for God. That self-control comes in there, doesn't it? Because you're not righteous, and you're going to fear the judgment to come if you don't have self-control over the things that become idols in your life. Two years... Paul sits in jail. He's forgot about. But Jesus was still there by his side, whether we have words that say, take courage, whether he came to him each day and said that or not, we don't know. But it's not exactly how you would think this story would end with Paul just sitting in jail. But thank goodness we know the rest of the story. Kim, you can text Sherry if you want to. <laughs> in part of closing... I just want to ask you a bunch of questions. How do you know the Spirit's voice? These are questions for you. I'm not giving you any answers. These are questions for myself. These are questions I probably came up with for me more than you. <laughs> are you listening? Are you in constant prayer? Are you reading God's Word as much as you intake food? Man may not live by bread alone. Are you really, really in love with Jesus? How about like you were at first? Are you expecting to hear an answer? Not just crying out in the dark? Are you persistent in your prayer? How is your faith? Have you asked Him to increase your faith? How many things are you focused on doing rather than what God might be calling you to do? Is there anything you're not willing to listen to and do? Are there things hindering me from hearing? Any sins that entangle? Do you love the Lord with all of your being? How about your neighbor? Is fruit growing in you like Galatians says? Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. They should be growing on the vine so that others can see that fruit and partake in it. Are you, willingly, are you willing to suffer, suffer patiently waiting for the answer? Paul waited two years, but he remembered these words. I guarantee you if Jesus did not come and speak them to him in person, if Jesus came to him and stood by him, stood at his side and said, Take courage, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. If he'd have spent 20 years instead of two years, what Jesus told him will happen. What Jesus said is, I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you may be also. Is that what motivates you to live this life, no matter what the circumstances are? I know sometimes we want to figure it all out. We want faith to be sight and everything else. But you know what? You don't have it all figured out. But God does. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that you have all figured it out from the beginning of time, that you knew that my sins would separate me from you, and you knew that you would send your Son, who would give up heaven, face the mockery and the abuse of mankind, and then face your wrath so that I could be set free. Help me to live out my life in fear and trembling of this awesome salvation. In, in uh, love and peace and joy that I can only know from, Je from knowing Jesus Christ. Where my life is not my own, but my life is yours. 
Lord, help me to be a vessel. Help me to be a light. Help me to be the hands and feet. Lord, when things get in the way, Lord, do whatever you need to do to take those things from me so that I don't let anything stand in the way of loving you the way that you love me. Father, we just thank you and praise you for, for Paul's testimony, for David, for your word. We thank you most of all for Jesus and what he did on Calvary to set us free and that we know without a shadow of a doubt that he will return and take us home. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.